20, uh, 35 years ago, I took my young family from uh, yeah, the Netherlands all the way Isn't via this planet yeah, to New Zealand. I migrated, indeed I did. And as a good Dutchman, I came here with nothing, and I still got most of it left. <laughs> um, I did indeed, I, do, I did fell, fell in love with the country, of course, but I did get a job with the Ministry of Anger and Fish Heads, indeed, as an entomologist. <laughs> A talkback show on News Talk ZB, which was great fun as well. And, uh, but there, I started to get a bit worried on the talkback show, because I got these crazy questions, which actually annoyed me. Actually, they pissed me off. They were like, how do I kill this? How do I kill that? And, get this, how do I eradicate ants from my garden? This was a real question. I said... Excuse me, how do I eradicate ants from my gun? I said, well, but eradicate is a big word, man. I want them eradicated, I want them all gone. I said, use my favorite insecticide. And that is? Napalm. <laughs> how do you spell that? Don't go there. <laughs> this is the thing you see. For all these decades, I've been trying to look for a more sensible answer and to give insects and, envi and, and the environment a little bit of a voice. So. Here we go. This world, this planet of ours is not run by the media. Certainly not all these silly social media. It's not run by, by the stock market or economists. It's not run by politicians. It's not run by oil companies or that crappy ISO 9002 quality management system. In fact, it's not run by any people whatsoever, no matter what the business herald might think from time to time. I've got news for you. This world is run by bugs. I should be more politically correct. Of course, it's run by biodiversity. Really? But because I'm biased and because I'm on this stage and I'm an entomologist, I, it's run by the biodiversity of bugs. <laughs> Maybe now's a good time to do a ve I'm slowing down. Maybe it's a good time to do a whirlwind tour of ecosystem services by bugs, what they do for us all the time and for free, 24-7. Important word, free for a Dutch person, you know? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this creature at the top here is the honeybee, and it pollinates one-third of your diet. Some pollinators are very uh, sort of liberal in what they pollinate. Others are very specific. Give you an example. You go into the Amazon rainforest, and guess what you find? The orchid bee, beautiful and blue, screams through the forest, up, down, back, and forth. And you know when two bees meet, they do what kids describe a spot of WWF wrestling which is, of course, rubbish, because they touch each other, they smell each other, they feel each other, and they communicate. Where did you get the pollen on your back? Where did you find that orchid, and how do I get there? There's stuff going on in this, in this planet of, uh, on this planet of Earth that we have no idea. How many insects are involved in the subsequent distribution of the seeds? Have a look. It's brilliant. We always think as bugs eating our plants, but you know there are plants that eat bugs? Pitcher plants lure insects into their little tube there. The walls are too smooth for the insects to get out, and they basically drown in the soup at the bottom of the external stomach of the plant. Now, if you're a bug eater like this frog, wouldn't you sit, sit there at the top? All you need to do is open your mouth, <laughs> and all four courses fly straight in. <laughs> it's stuff like that. You look at... You know, the fantail, which is in New Zealand, of course, a very cute little bird. It's got a diet of 99% insects, and it follows you as you go hiking through the forest. And people say, it's a cute bird. It loves us human beings. No, no, it loves the way we keep beasts going. You know, flies and cockroaches, and, and hurry them up, because the fantail will be snapping right behind you, getting all this invertebrate protein. But here's a word of warning. This guy is the closest living relative to Tyrannosaurus rex, so there is no telling what may happen when fantails go bad. <laughs> in, the, in the western United States is a creature called the Roadrunner. You may know it from cartoons, and no, it doesn't bloody go beep beep. <laughs> but it does run really fast along the road, where it picks little insects that are mortally wounded as cars speed by on the road. And it is, as such, the fastest bird on two legs. Not always fast enough, I may hasten to add, but, you know, I'm sure that <laughs> evolution will take care of that at some stage. 
If you look at the number of organisms on this planet that actually use invertebrates, you know, as the basis of a food chain, it's incredible, especially mammals. The old howler monkey there constantly lifts leaves up and looks on the underside to find scale insects, grubs, caterpillars, beetles, because who would turn down this brilliant invertebrate protein? I tell you who, human beings. We are somehow not very keen on terrestrial invertebrate for food, are we? We don't, we don't give a stuff, we don't give a stuff about these things. We, we don't, we don't mind invertebrates from the sea. We call those delicacies. We pay extra for crayfish and power and, and pippies and all these things and, and oysters. But invertebrates from the land, nah. And that's a real shame, because these guys have got protein that contains virtually no cholesterol, it's very high in, in good minerals and things like that, can be grown in very small areas, and convert green material into protein about five times better than cattle and sheep. And they breed like the clappers. <laughs> so, if you think about it, if we are looking at 9 billion people on the planet in 2050, we might want to take another look at creating insect protein for human food. All this consumption, of course, leads to something else, and that's dung. Scientists have calculated if we don't have any dung-removing insects, fungi, or bacteria, we would take four years and we're under seven, seven feet of um, uh, dung. And if you think that's funny, I'd like you to consider how you're going to get to work on Monday. <laughs> right? This is important because dung removal is an extremely important ecosystem service for a lot of different creatures, including this dung beetle. Now, in New Zealand, of course, we, we didn't have any mammals. We had a lot of birds. And even sloppy bird poos are collected by our native ants. They tear the protein away, take it to the nest, and feed it to their kids which I always make sure that I tell the kids when I'm talking at schools, aren't you lucky you weren't raised in an ant's nest? <laughs> you don't have to be a gardener to look under the lid of a compost bin and see it teeming with life, with each creature having its own job. Slaters do rotting wood, the larvae of that, that housefly do the green glass, grass clippings that you just dumped in there, and cockroaches, cockroaches are amazing. They've got a business card that says, We've lived for 350 million years. Oh, they're on the Keep New Zealand Beautiful bandwagon, I can see that. We recycle anything. Don't worry about a thing. And if you're one of the best recyclers in the world, wouldn't you team up with the messiest mammal in the world? <laughs> this is very important. So you're driving over State Highway 1, and you drive over a feral animal, let that be a possum, and you kill it. Who do you think is there first at the scene of the accident? It ain't the cops, I can tell you that. It's a gravid female blowfly that lands on the carcass, feels it, touches it, smells it, and then proceeds to lay half a dozen eggs in the ears of the dead possum. Half a dozen eggs in the eyes of the dead possum. Nose of the dead possum. <laughs> other orifices that shall remain nameless of the dead possum. So in no time, that possum literally walks off the road in the form of a column of very fast-moving maggots that are pupating on the side. And all you're left with is a flat bit of, of skin with fur and hair. And that is keratin, another resource. Who eats that? Well, not humans again, but carpet beetles. They, I always say God invented carpet beetles well before she invented carpets. The larva and the beetle. When a beetle comes into your house, it says, look, there's a couple of square meters of dead sheep on the floor. Uh, keratin, don't worry about a thing. Um, here is my business card. Where is my business? Here's my business card. I'll clean this up for you real quick. I've done it for three million years. And when they've finished, you'll find them on your chrysanthemum doing pollination. Isn't that gorgeous? But I want to take you back. I want to take you back to that fly on that turd. I know for a fact it's a Jack Russell turd because it's my dog. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> hey, 
Have a look on that fly. It's left rear leg. That's what the picture is about. There's a hitchhiker sitting there, a pseudo scorpion, a miniature version of a mite with pincers that actually needs a ride from one turret to the next or from one compost bin to the next. And the Musca domestica is the Boeing 737 of that particular creature. And if you think this only happens in New Zealand, think again. The harlequin beetle from Venezuela has its own species of pseudo scorpion. And it's actually more kinkier than that because that guy goes under these wings of that beetle. And in every log where the, where the, where the beetle and the, and the pseudoscorpion visit, this, the pseudoscorpion only lets females come on board. And if a male tries to go, say, stay away, my plane, bugger off. <laughs> Until he's got about 12 there. So we didn't even invent, invent the one mile high club. Anyway, <laughs> that's another story. Agriculture, horticulture, we are all, that's another ecosystem service, rely on the natural predators of our pests. That way we allow to become a little bit of 100%, almost 100% clean and green country by growing our food at least with a minimum amount of pesticides. This is important too. Then we have arts, culture and entertainment. Now, whether it's the ceremonial headdress of a chief in Papua New Guinea or the scarab beetle from Egypt, Insects have always inspired us. And in fact, in the past, we used to go to flea circuses, which were really cool. There was this little case there with all these uh, contraptions, and you would then see fleas. And there was a lot of trickeries, but you did see fleas tethered up to little silver threads carrying carriages. And the coolest thing of all was, at the end of the night, if you're lucky, you were allowed to take some performers home. <laughs> so now we pay big, big dollars to go to the caves to watch glowworms backlit. And if you live in Japan, you have your own kuwagata or your own kabutomushi. And you take them to school and you have fights with these beetles. There's a whole enormous uh, uh, industry around that with, with comics and with DVDs and all that sort of stuff. A lot of institutions in New Zealand and elsewhere are looking at bugs for new compounds for medicines. Here are just a couple of examples. It's a thing that is a repository there of good ideas. Talking about good ideas, biomimicry is basically about good ideas. Biomimicry is one of my favorite subjects, I suppose, because it's about learning from nature without harming it. You want to talk about robotics? Look no further than cockroaches. You want to talk about robotics on water? Water strider. I've seen the robots made. By the way, that robot there was one of the, one of the Mars buggy sort of things in the, you know, five, six years ago. It's fabulous stuff. So you want to carry on. Flight. If you want to study flight, go straight to the dragonfly. 150 million years, eats one insect every 30 minutes, frugal, and it has wings that are light, strong, and a possible building material of the future. This is the sort of stuff I'm talking about. Bugs inspire us all the time. You want to have carpets or materials without toxic dyes? Structural color is the way to go. You find it in feathers. You find it in butterfly wings. It's, it's that sort of thing. Newest Kevlar? The bum end of a spider. These spigots extrude this brilliant spider silk, which is light, strong, six times stronger than steel, and, and can be molded into all sorts of fabrics. It also, the, the opposite to wool, shrinking and, and expanding and things like that from when it's wet and dry. It's absolutely fabulous material to work with. So there you go. Here are all these little, if you like, um, ideas. But there's another little idea for those of you that are in business. If you're looking at something totally different, Look at Hymenoptera, the wasps, the bees, and the ants. Because yes, they use sustainable material, wood, to make all these wonderful hexagonal buildings strong with. They actually also navigate, they communicate, and they cooperate. They don't compete. They work together. And here comes the killer. They build all this stuff without a bloody business plan. <laughs> all right? That's where I'm leaving that. This is very important, though. All right, so with all these things that we now know about bugs, it's quite clear that without insects or invertebrates on the planet, we'd have three, four months to live, that we know that. But still, some scientists go to great lengths to, to calculate the value of biodiversity and to calculate the value of bugs. And there's all sorts of figures, and impressive figures. Robert Costanza, 1997, 33 trillion is, is a good number. That was the, the GDP of a, a large country in those days. 
But it all counts for nothing if our economic system does not recognize the value of that biodiversity at all. And we keep on using natural capital as if it costs nothing and is always available. So we need to put eco back into economics. This is important. Here's a couple of things to think about if you want to go that way. I'm not an economist either. I don't want to be an economist, for God's sake. What is it with this growth at all costs? What is that? How does that work? Explain that to me. Because if an insect would grow like we have grown, there would be predators, parasites, pathogens, diseases. Everybody would be gunning for them. And we seem to be constantly staving all that off. But that's beside the point. Here's something positive. A list of things that we can do. All right? These are, and the bottom one is lovely. Respect. Because it takes care of graffiti as well. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that. But also important is, and that's sort of my hobby, if you like, the idea of the next generation. Now, what would all this look like? Let's go to the green column. What would that look like in Christchurch City? Earthquake, lots of buildings destroyed, building back things back up again. So we've got the economists. Go. Is this good for the, the... What was it? The earthquake is good for our GDP, for our economy. It was the first thing that Key said. Anyway, I don't want to go there. Here we go. Buildings, and here comes a councillor that says, I want to put beehives on every building in Christchurch. So I got together with some ecologists, mate, and we talked about it. We came to two conclusions. One is that traditional economics or traditional economists and some councillors and, and politicians are never the first fly on the third, really. They may stay longer. <laughs> And the second thing we discussed was, what are these bees going to eat? Rubble? Wouldn't it be nice if we could have some plants with the right pollen and the right nectar that would feed those bees and also attract the parasites, the predators, and all these other creatures that we need for our sustainable gardens? And wouldn't it be great then to have these gardens that also feed the butterflies which kids can muck about with? So what do you need? You need a university, you need students, you need research that tells these are the great plants to use. Then you need a seed merchant who knows about the seeds and can package them all together and puts them all in these little packets with labels. And then we need, this is cool, you need a marketing idea or a way to sell it. And here you go. We've got farmer's markets for the community, by the community. And then what you get is this. You get community, community science by which the community does observations. This creature pollinates that at that time. And then you can, you can then involve kids and log it all on Nature Watch website. But the coolest thing is this. You get kids that become ecological detectives without killing insects. They are drawn not to the top but to the bottom, to the tiniest creatures on the planet. And they can study them. And they ride into it like focused these kids will have all the tools for the future. And as the Dutch people say, if you go and talk to kids, you have got three generations for the price of one. <laughs> but these kids will then know about biodiversity, and particularly about the biodiversity of bugs, something that we cannot live without. Ah, we are now launching the new packets of seeds that are just talk to you about. There you go. Thank you.